don't have a formal agenda for today. We're just kind of regrouping here. I know it's been a, a lot of challenge around COVID-19 and trying to work and do things. And we've all been meeting in Zoom meetings and hopefully sooner than later, we'll be back uh, with some distance in-person stuff so we can continue on uh, the great work that, that we're doing. But I think part of today too is is really just to have a discussion on, you know, we're doing a lot with dementia friendly and I know we'll get an update on that from Sherry. Uh, but first, uh, Sally, do we have anyone new to the committee that we need to introduce? Um, you know what, what, maybe we can just go around real quick since there's not tons of people and if maybe everybody could just give their name and where they're from or who, who they're representing, what organization. Um, Great. So let's start with Nanette. Uh, good morning. My name is Nan Rodriguez. I work, um, I oversee the social services area for the Mesa Fire Department. And you have somebody with you? Yeah, I do. I'm Jean DeStories. Hi. I shifted over to in the room here with her. Uh, Jean DeStories, Mesa Fire Social Service Area. Thank you. Karen. Uh, Karen Stegenja, volunteer with Oakwood Creative Care. Thank you. Becky. Uh, I'm unmute. Oh, I am unmuted. I am Becky Friend with Akoya Mesa Senior Living. We have an awesome um, memory care unit. So I thought this would be a good fit for me to see what's going on in Mesa. Great. Todd. Yeah, I'm just Todd Carlane. I am with Fellowship Square Mesa. Thank you. Kelsey. Hi, Kelsey Brown. I work in the Social Services Division with Mesa Fire. Thank you. Tom. Tom and Trieri, uh, Mesa Police Department, currently assigned to the Academy, Basic Academy, Training awesome. Academy. Thank you. Kristen. Hi, I'm Kristen Harvey. I'm with Jewish Family and Children Services um, out of our East Valley Health Care Center in, um, right in the corner of Mesa and Gilbert. Thanks. Lori. Lori Marsh, the Marketing Director at the Summit at Sunland Springs. I'm taking over Craig Sr.'s um, role in the Aging and Healthcare Committee. Thanks. Kelly. Good morning, everyone. I'm Kelly Kiefer. I'm the Chief Nursing Officer here at Baywood and Hart, uh, representing Banner Health. Thanks. Nicole. Hi, everyone. I'm Nicole Magny. I manage public policy for Cronus SES. Um, we're a cyber protection company that serves the healthcare community among other public sector uh, organizations. Thanks, Nicole. Heather. Um, hi, I'm Heather Nelson. I'm from the library. We used to have Carl Smith representing us, and, and now it's me. Thank you. Sherry. Sherry Friend with Oakwood Creative Care. Thanks. Hi, Michelle. Hi, I'm Michelle Coldwell with Senator Kirsten Cinema's office. Thanks for being here. Norm? Hi, I'm Norm DeVay. I'm with Copa Health, uh, formerly Mark Community Resources. Jennifer? Yeah, I'm Jennifer with Fairway Independent Mortgage. I focus on reverse mortgages and regular mortgages, but I just have a love for the senior community. Thank you. Bianca. Hi, this is Bianca from Senator Kirsten's Cinema's office. Thank you. Shelly. Good morning. I'm Shelly Berry with Gateway Bank. I'm a former board member of Oakwood Creative Care and a dementia friend champion. Thank you. Okay, and we have someone on the phone? 8280. It's uh, good morning. Therese Daravan with uh, Mesa Fire Emergency Management. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right, Glenn, back to you. All right, and thank you, everybody. Uh, I'm Glenn Kasperzik. I'm uh, with American Medical Response. I'm the co-chair of this committee with uh, my colleague over here, Sherry Friend, on this committee. So uh, once I drop off, she will continue on. And I think the first thing uh, we'll get started with is uh, our update uh, from Senator Cinema's office. We have Michelle and Bianca uh, on the line here today. And as always, uh, appreciate uh, you joining us. And we know Senator Cinema is doing great things. Uh, in DC, uh, albeit uh, I was listening to a call uh, earlier this week and there's certainly some uh, political headwinds uh, to get some of these things done to say it uh, politely, but uh, she's uh, been out there uh, a champion for, for Arizona and really proud to, to have her represent us here and the work that uh, she's doing. So with that, we'll turn it over to uh, Michelle and Bianca for an update there. Great, um, so for some of you who are on the chamber call this week, um, unfortunately, we don't have much good news for the next Corona package. 
Um, they are negotiating every day, the party leadership, um, but we are not optimistic that anything will get done this week, um, which means typically they adjourn for August recess after this week. So we don't really know what next week is gonna look like if there's they're gonna adjourn or if they're gonna stay through recess. Um, there's a couple of priorities that Senator Cinema is working to get in the next package. Um, one of them is cutting red tape around testing and PPE um, to try to make it safer for people to go back to school. Um, we're focusing on getting some broadband services into the next bill so that students who don't have internet um, or computers, that kind of thing, can still learn remotely, especially if they are immunocompromised or in a high risk category. Um, we're trying to continue and strengthen the unemployment program. As some of you may know, the extra $600 um, a week expired, uh, I want to say a week or two ago, last week. Um, the senator would love to maintain it at the $600 a week through the end of the year, but we don't. That's not uh, something that has been agreed to by both parties. So we'll see what we can get there. Unfortunately, there's some talk about it being a formula um, across the country, which we have been told by DES would cause a, at least a month delay in being able to get the program back up and running, which would not be great for the hundreds of thousands of people in Arizona that are still unemployed. Um, we are also working on strengthening the PPP program. Um, and additional resources to local, directly to local and state governments. So like I said, we're not optimistic that something will get done by this week. Um, so we'll continue to work. If your organizations have um, things that you're hoping can be in the next package, I'm gonna drop an email in the chat box. You can send over any requests that you have there. We'll make sure it gets to our policy team and the Senator. And that's it. Great, thank you, Michelle. Uh, as always, again, appreciate the updates. Uh, hopefully, uh, we'll get some good news soon, and they'll get some of the uh, some of the things sorted out so the community can benefit for many of those that are still struggling through this time. So, uh, with that, um, well, why don't we turn it over to uh, Sherry, and we'll get an update on the uh, dementia-friendly city. Hi, everybody. So I hopefully you all have hear, heard the amazing news that um, that Mesa has officially been designated as a dementia friendly city. So um, we successfully went through the process of submitting all of the paperwork and um, Sally has been working with the mayor's office to get a proclamation from the mayor. So Sally, do you want to give us an update on that? Uh, yes, we have a copy of the proclamation, although it's not official until he actually reads it at council, which will be on the 24th. So once that happens, we can get copies out to everybody and, you know, everybody can have a copy for themselves if they want it. Pretty exciting. It's super exciting. Yeah. Like, so exciting. Um, but we are in good company. I heard that, um, it, during COVID, also the city of Scottsdale and the city of Phoenix just finished their dementia-friendly process as well. So, um, so now it's um, Tempe, Surprise, Mesa, Scottsdale, and Phoenix that all have that designation, which is pretty incredible. Um, we did get 68 responses back from the survey that was sent out, which is a, a decent response. Um, so when our task committee meets, hopefully in person, um, we'll be able to dive through that data and really decide the direction that we want to go um, as a committee. There are currently some uh, Zoom sessions to become a dementia friend or a dementia, dementia champion. That is done through Banner. Karen is trained to be able to do those trainings. So we could set up some Mesa specific dementia friendly trainings. Um, Karen, do you wanna talk more about that or? 
Uh, sure. Uh, yeah, I listened in. Um, I've been a champion for probably two or three years, and I know we had someone else that said they were a champion as well, so they can do the trainings. Um, I just listened in on one to make sure I had the most up-to-date materials, and I do. It's it's fairly simple. It's a it's a script that they give you, and you pretty much uh, read it word for word as far as uh, when you do the presentation. So it's about an hour. Um, and I'm happy to set up dates. Uh, everything is done via, via Zoom or Skype. I think it was Skype that Banner's using. So, uh, yeah, we, we can, I don't know how we get the word out to the public, but we can certainly start doing that. I think some folks on our committee as well have, have attended some of the sessions. So, um, ready to go whenever we decide how we want to promote it. Yeah, and I'll just share Kelly from. Go, oops, sorry. Oh, no, go ahead. This is Ke uh, this is Kelly from Baywood um, and Banner. We did um, several sessions here for individuals that were interested in uh, in becoming champions. So we do have several champions here on our campus, and I just want to um, also let you know some really exciting news here at Baywood and Hart is we just received our accreditation through the American College of Emergency Physicians for the geriatric accreditation, which kind of goes in hand in hand with the dementia. So um, we're happy to help in any way. Is awesome. Yeah. Yeah, great work, uh, Sherry. And is there a, either in the chat box or can we, uh, Sally, get uh, information out regarding this to the group? So for those that are on the call and that may not be overly familiar with it, they can see the links and maybe access some of the, the training tools and components of it that way. Uh, at our next meeting, you know, Sherry, I think we really start to hopefully we'll be in a better spot to start. Uh, maybe it's the mid person, but at the very least, maybe start laying the, the pathway on the educational tools and things we can do around, uh, you know, the program in the community, make sure that, you know, the, the appropriate agencies have that information uh, so they can share and get that with their teams. Uh, so look forward to getting more uh, on that very soon to the group and then, you know, having a lot more dialogue around that so we can, we can roll that out. I mean, it's a big accomplishment. It's great to see other communities uh, doing it as well and, and considering the challenging times that we're in to be able to get that done. You know, fantastic work uh, there, Sherry. Look forward to the mayor's proclamation, uh, you know, with support of that. I think all of those things coupled together will really uh, make this program be extremely successful in the community. Well, since Karen um, has the ability to do training, do we want to schedule something like a Zoom for um, folks that want to either attend or send others that they're working with to attend? Yeah, so I think it's a, a great idea to, to do that. So if we can work on getting that set up and, yeah. and coordinated, I think that'd be fantastic. I think it'd be great to be able to tell, you know, the mayor or, or council that either we've done it or you know, it, it's scheduled for a certain day and, and to just, you know, try and get as many people as possible on that, um, the, the more simple training, you know. Yeah, no, very good. Yeah, and then, you know, depending on the attendance, making sure that if it, if it can be recorded or shared or we can do something so those that weren't able to attend or they can go back to their individual organizations and agencies and be able to continue that through their, their group will be, will be very helpful. Right. Sherry, anything, I, anything else? Uh, I put Karen's email in the chat. So if you want to reach out to Karen di directly to get something scheduled for your, um, your network, you can, you can do that and work with her um, without me getting in the middle and <laughs> making that more complicated. So, um, so that's there. And I do agree, Sally, of, of maybe getting one scheduled that's open to chamber met members or having mm -hmm. it monthly even but it is really good if we can track um which karen would be able to do we can track how many people in mesa we've trained through. yeah i think i think it makes sense to do that and if we could um you know set it up maybe in the next i don't know couple of weeks three weeks um karen maybe you and i can chat offline and, and find a date or a couple of different dates to invite people out okay we're happy to do an open that. calendar. 
I yeah. think that's an that's an easy win for us during the pandemic to be able to to train as many people as yeah. we can. Yeah, I, as I agree. I think it, it makes sense. Some people have some downtime. And Norm, Norm, um, put a, a note in chat. Norm, do you want to talk about what this training is that you're doing? <clears throat> yeah, annually, um, Copa Health always puts on a. Uh, emergency preparedness conference and you know the odd thing was last year we had uh, planning for a pandemic and it was so on point for this and we uh, we worked with the state on this and they have us focus on four populations uh, uh um, id dd people de developmental disabilities children uh the homeless behavioral health but then seniors is a big portion of it and we uh we're working with fellowship uh um village on that todd carling and john scott and so it's going to be a fairly big training. It's going to be a, a Zoom meeting, hopefully about 300 people. But we can add some advertisement to this if you want. If you just want some shout outs, I could put it in uh, the agenda and stuff of that day. So if, if you want to get the word out a little bit more, we're going to have uh, a pretty good audience that day. That would be great. Um, can you get us the information for your training? Is it open to the public? I will. It is open. It, it's open to the public. We're focusing on the population that we're talking about today. So yeah. you all would be great for it. And uh, we're actually now I know I'm getting a little bit too much into self promotion, but we're putting together about an hour long um, documentary style video uh, about uh, resiliency in a pandemic. And we've interviewed, uh, you know, people, leaders from organizations in all those groups. And um, so it's going to be pretty good, but I'll get information. And uh, um, Sally, if I send it to you, if you could send it out to the group. Yes. Uh, you can share it with whoever you want. And yes, first come, first serve. That'd be great. Thank you. Great. Sally, did we have any open items carrying over that we needed to discuss? Uh, I look back through my notes. I didn't see anything or Sherry that we needed to touch on. No, but it, it might be good for us to get um, an update from PD and fire and see where they're at besides tired and stressed. <laughs> and <laughs> Maybe Tom um, could give us an update from PD. Yeah, so reference uh, the pandemic and the PD's response and in de dealing with the community. Um, we had set up uh, a series of protocols early on. I believe it was March 16th, March 16th, 17th. And they were pretty stringent at the time because obviously the information was pretty limited. We've maintained those um, while working in partnership with our, our um, with Mesa Fire and um, being able to get access to PPE for both our personnel as well as um, those folks we come across during the normal course of business. Uh, in many cases, uh, some of these folks, uh, regardless of age or demographics, um, were, have been reluctant, um, but nonetheless, we've had uh, pretty good success on helping educate the population on, on um, the necessary steps in order to maintain their, their health and well-being. Um, as, an, as an organization, I think that we have continued to evolve. Uh, we have daily meetings still. Um, and in, in terms of trying to assess what different parts of our population uh, what, what their needs are and how we can respond accordingly with the resources we have available to us. And I think this is also, this is also kind of opened up opportunities for us to uh, think much differently in terms of how we do business. Um, you know, I know there's a, there's a lot of, as, as we all know, there's, there's, there's a lot of discussion nationwide debate about law enforcement specifically and how we do our business. Um, I could tell you it's, it's almost a misnomer um, when we compare police agencies from different parts of the country to one another because we all do things very differently. Um, and, and I'm happy to say that I think we do things rare, fairly well co in comparison. So I am, I'm very optimistic that as, we're, as we continue to move forward and our involvement with the community, with the various units that we have and, and the engagements that we have, um, that will continue to uh, be positive and be professional and be able to find better ways to do business. 
Yeah, certainly. Uh, you know, it's, I can imagine you know the challenges with law enforcement coupled with the pandemic. Uh, they are these are challenging times. I think part of you know this, where even as a committee, uh, you know, as we kind of continue the discussion, is where have some of these challenges have been, right? And we we kind of take. Uh, some opportunity here to look back to look at the progress we've made, but where some of the challenges have been and then where this committee can kind of focus and support the community and agencies so we can continue to to, to grow what we're doing here uh, and keep the good work going. So I appreciate uh, that update. And then uh, from Mesa Fire, Sally, who's the, the best person on the call to give an update there? That's a good question. And maybe Nan? No, we're going to pass it over to Therese. Therese is our EOC captain. <laughs> Hi. Um, uh, so we're going to piggyback on what um, Tom said as far as PD. So we're doing a lot of that too. Um, and then also we started the march on getting PPE. So that has now been distributed out to the city. So that are the PPE for the rest of the city is coming out of the warehouse. Um, but right now we have a pretty good handle on that. Uh, we are also doing outreach too. So we are currently calling um, folks in their home. So Nan and Jean can tell you a little bit about that if you have questions. But that's kind of how we're doing it just a little bit differently now that COVID's hit, is we're calling and making sure that our community has food and other resources. So just a different style of doing what we do. Thank you. Uh, speaking of food, it looks like Mr. Richards is on the phone from United Food Bank. Dave, are you there? Dave? Yes, I had to, I had to get to the unmuting portion of my... Do you, do you want to give an update? Uh, sure. Um, we're continuing our Mesa Cares program. It's been a great partnership with the city of Mesa. Um, we're at the convention center through the end of... September now. Uh, we're just doing the contract to, to, to be there to do food distribution and, and um, emergency food bag packing and all that kind of stuff that's there. Um, we're seeing still pretty steady about 1,800 households a week through our distribution and then our networks holding steady with historic uh, highs. The one thing that's kind of challenging, I don't know if any of your organizations have been reached out to by uh, food vendors that have uh, the farmers to family food boxes. Uh, there's a coronavirus uh, food relief uh, program that um, that USDA instituted. It didn't really flow through the food banks. And so there's a lot of these food boxes floating out in the community. Uh, we estimate uh, probably over 300,000 food boxes washing around Arizona. And so um, we have seen that hit some of our the ways that we count uh, some of our emergency food bags because this has supplanted some of those. Um, so if your organizations uh, you have had uh, some of these boxes offered to you or if you've distributed them, I, I'd love to just be aware of them and where they're going in the community. We do take some of them and distribute them through our network. Um, we hand them out at the Mesa Convention Center and, and some other partnerships that we're doing. Um, and if your organization has a need for some, some food relief, we have access to some stuff. So uh, just reach out and let us know. That's all I got, Great. Sally. Thank you. Hey, one thing on the uh, PPE front uh, that is emerging is extra large rubber gloves. So for those of you who use those, make sure you're, you're looking at your vendors and your stockpile. Uh, our organization's national procurement has, we, we've been seeing some tr interesting PPE trends and that is one area where they're running out of supply. So uh, pay attention to, to your, your rubber gloves. Uh, with that, I, uh, like I said, I have to drop off uh, here, but I'll circle back to Sally and Sherry, but we'll turn it over to, to Sherry and continue the update. Um, maybe Sally continue to go around with some of uh, some of the other partners on on the call here to get some local updates. But I think part of this is setting up for the next meeting and then what areas to, to focus on and talk about and some of the challenges so we can have a, a structured agenda for next time and, and get this restarted uh, from the break and some of the COVID uh, challenges we've had. So I look forward to, to that and circling back to get those updates and then uh, we'll see everybody uh, formally 
uh, next month. I anticipate we'll probably be in a Zoom format again, just based on where the current trends are going for the month. So uh, with that, thank, thank you everybody for your time and I'll hand it over to Sherry. Thanks, Glenn. Hey, Sally or Sherry. Yeah. Um, on the technology committee, I, I wanted to share a couple things. Um, Tom um, went out to eat. Tom, I don't, I don't mean to put you on the spot, <laughs> that, but that story you shared with me last month about when you guys went out to eat, right. and you, can you share that real quick? And then I want to do an, uh, I, I have a couple things that I'm working on with the technology side with dementia that I think that could be applicable. Right. So if I remember correctly, it was actually Father's Day. So I don't know what day yeah. that was. Um, I think that's in June, right? Um, yeah. So um, I love cheeseburgers. So um, my family said, hey, let's go out to Fuddruckers. So we went to Fuddruckers up in Mesa. I live in Gilbert. So we drove up to Mesa, went to Fuddruckers. And after dinner, um, loading everybody in the in the truck so it's my wife myself and my three children 20 year old daughter 19 year old daughter and 15 year old son um as i'm about to pull out of the parking spot um i notice an older female walking off of the sidewalk access point from southern east southern um coming south into the parking lot and she was waving to me. So I noticed her out of the corner of my eye, uh, put the window down, engaged her, and she had a walker. And it was a hot day. I remember it was a very hot, humid afternoon. Um, and so I, I got out of my truck, I asked her if she needed help. And she was well-dressed, had jewelry on, um, spoke well, um, she was, obviously in some distress because of the weather and she had been out outside for some time. So with her walker, she was able to sit there. Uh, my wife went inside, got some water from uh, uh, the restaurant for her. Um, and, and I started just talking with her and, and trying to determine what her, what her needs were and, and where, where she was at. She appeared to somewhat know where she was at location wise, but it was obvious to me in, in engaging with her, that she's suffering from a form of dementia. Uh, still very well spoken again, um, dressed very, very nicely. Um, so it, it was apparent to me that this is, this is something probably new. Um, I worked to extract information from her as, at, you know, as kind as I could because she was just such a sweet lady. I, I really enjoyed talking to her. Um, and I was able to get little pieces of information, you know, her, her daughter's name, the business her son-in-law owns, uh, but she couldn't give me any phone numbers, she couldn't give me any addresses. Um, and then my, my next thought was, well, maybe she's missing, maybe somebody reported her. So I called dispatch to uh, send a couple of units over. Um, and it was kind of funny because here I am, uh, you know, I've been with Mesa now 25 years. Um, and I'm dressed in a t-shirt and soccer shorts, soccer shoes, uh, very casual. And I'm, I'm sitting out here at Fuddruckers and two patrol officers roll up and they get out and I don't recognize them. They don't recognize me. And so they're like, okay, what do you got? I'm like, yeah, the, you know, this lady, she's, she came up upon us. I think, you know, she needs some help. Um, and I kind of wanted, it, it was, I apologize, but I kind of wanted to use it as a test test site to see what my what our personnel how they would react react respond to this situation. And the first officer walks up to us and says, "Man, do you have any ID?" And I said, "Listen." I said, "Whoa, whoa, whoa! I just told you she doesn't have any ID. She doesn't have any contact information. This is her information that she gave me. Can you go run run an inquiry?" He's like, "Well," and I could tell he's kind of new. The other kid, uh, and I say kid because they're they're young. Uh, he's looking at me too, and I said, "Hey guys, um, full disclosure. My name's Tom Entrieri. I'm a commander. Uh, I run the academy now." Uh, and they both looked at me like, "Sir," I said, "Listen, this lady needs your help. This is why you are here. This is why you do this job. 
recognize that this is somebody's mother, this is somebody's grandmother. Um, and so they, they understood that this, was, this wasn't a criminal matter, this was how can we help? Um, so long, long in the story, the, well, I, I guess I can't miss that point. So nobody had reported her yet. Um, we came to find out that she lives in a community uh, close to Broadway and Power. She had walked about a mile, mile and a half in 108, 110 degree weather. Um, and nobody was, nobody had reported her at that point. They were able to then, during our conversation, track down uh, a call that had just come in uh, regarding a welfare check. Um, so they were able to backtrack. At this point, we still didn't know any of her, inf her personal information, family relations, anything like that. Nobody had that information available. Officers brought her back to her residence. There was no management on site. Um, so her personal information could not be accessed for us to make notifications. And I told them to contact me directly. I didn't care, you know, whether I was on duty or off duty, I wanted them to call me that night to let me know if they had that information. I went home and through open source data, I started doing research. I actually was able to track down um, her, her daughter and son-in-law, left a message, uh, sent a couple of emails, business emails, phone, phone numbers. Um, and that was about 7 p.m. 10.30 that night, I got a call from, from her daughter. Um, and she was in shock. She's like, oh my God, I just got your voicemail. I didn't know anything about this. Um, thank you so much for calling me. You know, yes, my, my mother is starting to suffer from, from dementia. Uh, we've taken her to a doctor recently. So this is a lady that's at the early stages, um, but it was obvious that the family was struggling with, with this realization that they have, a, uh, they have to deal with this situation that they have no experience in. And so I pretty much told her, so listen, my great aunt, who I was very close with, suffered and died from dementia-related illness. My mother suffered and died from dementia-related illness. I said, my family is very well-versed. Uh, I've ate more times in the Mayo Clinic's cafeteria um, when she was doing clinical, um, clinical, taking part in clinical studies. I'll walk you through this. So I knew they were looking for another place, another residence, because the place she was at obviously didn't have the skill set, um, and so I think it was that that next day, that Monday morning, when I reached out to Todd, I said, "Todd, is there anybody, any facility that you think has room that can help this family out, as well as gaining access to financial resources because they didn't have the necessarily the means to to pay for um, such a facility, and to ensure that she gets treatment early on, so that." she could have a better quality of life as long as possible. Um, and so that's kind of where it ended. Um, I've had the daughter reach out to me twice since then, um, letting me know she appreciates everybody's efforts, Todd. So thank you and your folks. Um, and just to let me know that her mom is doing well and that, uh, you know, she, she, felt, she felt blessed that people were willing to go out of their way to help her out. And, and I told her that's, that's the majority of the people. We just don't like to admit that. So, um, and that's pretty much it. Yeah, so, so Tom, these stories that Tom had, he experiences firsthand and he has a, a personal connection to dementia and, and what it means to residents. But I, I think as our goal as this committee is we need to get training and stuff more out to the community and um, so that we can spot and know how to ask questions um, for this. So on the technology side, so I was kind of overseeing the technology committee for this dementia stuff. I know on the technology side, when Tom first told me about his mother or there was another incident when he was a detective, I think, Tom, that uh, he was telling me about somebody opened the door and a, out of somebody's, another facility wandered out and it, it didn't turn out to be a very positive 
successful situation like this this one happened to be to where we're able to get him get her back home um and so we are talking about what kind of technology what kind of devices what can we do to put out and uh, we're actually testing some uh, smart watches that if they with fall prevention but it also has a gps unit to where if a resident of ours now were to go to Walmart and fall, I would, we would know about it and we could actually call and talk to them on the watch. Um, but it also has a GPS locator to where I can look in within 20 feet of where they're at. And um, then another project that we're working on with ASU and Amazon is some other things that will detect um, if they get up in the middle of the night, it will, it, it can alert somebody. Um, because that first situation that Tom was telling me about that didn't turn out very positive, was it four o'clock in the morning? And most people are not awake at uh, four o'clock in the morning to check on things. And this person left and escaped or found an open door and wandered out. Oh, so the dementia side, I mean, there's a lot of technology um, that could be useful or not on this, but we're, we're testing on a little bit about some more technology things that would apply and that could help out with, uh, with dementia, becoming more dementia friendly. But it also, in, 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 in with COVID and isolation, um, this is probably one of the worst things that could happen, isolation with seniors um, during this time and could help even bring on or more onset with dementia with seniors um, because of isolation. And so there's a lot of different things on technology side that we're working on that we're finding successful in overcoming isolation, but also could help with dementia. So. There, there's, there's our technology update and our stories. Thanks, Todd. Sure, you're muted. There you go. That's great. Any, anything else anybody wants to, to bring up or, um, or chat about? Lori, if you're talking, we can't hear you. <laughs> New mute system. I do have a question about the hydration drive. If anybody can answer to that. Dave is on the call still, so yes, he can. Okay. Um, my question is, who is receiving that water? I just want to speak to the program, and I feel like that I'm missing that piece of information. Sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, Different agencies will receive that water. So we'll get a request from a variety of sources. Uh, we've had Mesa Fire that didn't, that needed some. We've had different nonprofit agencies that need some. Um, so really it's there as a repository in the bank for anybody that needs, needs uh, assistance with some water. Um, we've even had some donors that have donated water through the program to go up to help the, so the Apache nation as well. And so, um, you know, we, we will follow do donor intent. If somebody wanted to you know, donate water to a specific thing, then we could get that water to them likely. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's really a community wide resource and it's just called upon as needed. Is the preference to have 12 ounce bottles? Um, those are typically the easy because they come palletized they're typically the easiest for us to move. Uh, whatever the bottle size, I guess they're 16. Uh, I think they're 16 ounce bottles. The, but I mean, if, if you had some larger ones, we could find a home for those too. So those would be great in homeless settings to give a little bit more volume per bottle to, to somebody. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Hey Dave, how close are you guys? Do you, do you know your count at this point? I don't. I know we're over, well over halfway. 
we've had some very generous donations and we just took two more truckloads from Costco. So awesome. there's a gal that captured them really, <laughs> it captured her imagination and, and she did it in honor of her brother who, who had uh, passed because of some heat related issues. And so um, she has been a dynamo this year. So <laughs> I'll get you a number and get it to you. That's great, thank you. All right, well, I think that's all that, that I had, unless anybody else has any more thoughts or comments or ideas for us to address at our next meeting. Quiet group. I know you're all going, come on, I've got another call at nine. <laughs> that's exactly just, what I'm thinking. <laughs> I just, I, 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 oh, go ahead. Can I have something um, with the dementia friendly or the Alzheimer's as well as um, Tom's story from the police department, what came up in our survey results as well as the international dementia conference survey results is that people just don't know resources and whether it's dementia related resources or just aging resources in the community. I think that's something that, we can probably concentrate on. I know when I was with the police department, we had uh, something on our website, the fire department has resources. So I think if that's one thing that we can look at is kind of putting together a list or something for resources, because that's what stuck out to me uh, internationally, as well as our Mesa survey, that that seemed to be where people needed most of their information. They felt comfortable with knowing about dementia, but they, especially the veterans, the veterans question. Um, so getting, getting that together would be a plus. So Karen, um, I, I'm glad you brought that up because it makes me think that if, if you can maybe give us the resources that we can all put on our own home, home pages and you know, things like that and put out on social media. But um, next week, you know, typically we have Mason Morning Live that we film, it's our TV show, it's kind of a, a talk show but we film it in person. We haven't done that since March. Um, next week, we will be filming a virtual. Um, it's not, I shouldn't say virtual. It, we're filming it virtually, but then it will be aired. So it's not like a, a Zoom call, um, but we will have uh, our aging and healthcare committee as the focus. And we will be talking about the Dementia Friendly um, Cities Initiative and um, the proclamation. And so Sherry and Lori and well, not Lori, but the summit and um, Glenn will all be on that call to talk about this very issue. So if, if you can get us some key um, pieces of that, Karen, that we could put at the end, you know, like for more information uh, or, or, you know, to share with your family kind of thing, um, we can have that as part of that, um, of that show. And it might be a good kind of wrap up um, because we can, we can have static slides too. Okay, and when would you need that by? Just so. um, next Tuesday or Wednesday. Okay. Because we're filming on Thursday. Okay. That would be really helpful, I think. And then um, we'll have that show. Uh, it will be aired on Channel 11 for a month until we air our next show. Um, but then we'll also have it on YouTube. So I can get you guys links to that. And if you can share that, uh, I think it'll be very full of information. So um, it'd be nice to you know get that um, that kind of segment out for everyone to see. Um, anyway, that's all Sherry. Sorry. It's exciting. Yes. Good, good way for us to talk about this group and the, the good work that everybody's doing. Um, and, you know, we're so blessed to have, um, our Senator offices on, but, you know, PD and fire to be involved. And it's just a very, um, nice community, uh, initiative that everybody's concerned about. That is it for me. <laughs> All right, well, let's end early so everyone can have a, a restroom break and get some coffee before your next Zoom meeting. Um, but thank you all for your time. Thank you for your great work and have a great day. Awesome, see you guys in a month, if not before. Thank you.